Hello and welcome. I'm Daria Yudakovsky, and I'm the Executive Director of USC Visions and Voices, the Arts and Humanities Initiative. I am so thrilled to be with you tonight and to share this virtual space with two incredible scholars and activists whose powerful work challenges systems of oppression and articulates a movement for liberation. Before we begin, we believe it's important to open our events by acknowledging the indigenous land that we share. The campuses of the University of Southern California were built on the sacred and unceded land of the Tongva people. We honor the Tongva and all indigenous people, past, present, and future, and their continued survival and contributions to our society. We also honor the legacy of the African diaspora and recognize that this country would not exist without the free, enslaved labor of Black people. We share these acknowledgments to raise awareness about histories that are too often erased or forgotten, to recognize our place in this history, and to affirm our commitment to social change. Our special guest this evening has been deeply involved in our nation's quest for economic, racial, and gender justice for decades. And I have personally been a fan for decades. As an educator, author, and activist, Dr. Angela Davis has powerfully advocated for communities who are most affected by poverty and racism. She's a distinguished professor emerita of the history of consciousness and feminist studies at UC Santa Cruz, and she has taught and lectured throughout the world. She's the author of nine books, including Freedom is a Constant Struggle, Ferguson, Palestine, and the Foundations of a Movement, and drawing on her own experience of incarceration in the 1970s after being placed on the FBI's 10 Most Wanted list and her extensive research, Dr. Davis has forged a 21st century abolitionist movement, urging audiences to think seriously about a future without prison. Dr. Davis will be interviewed by Ange Marie Hancock Alfaro, a professor of gender studies and political science at USC, an author of several books, including Solidarity Politics for Millennials, A Guide to Ending the Oppression Olympics, and Intersectionality, an Intellectual History. I also want to take a moment to welcome USC's incoming students. This is the very first Visions and Voices event that many of you are experiencing as a Trojan, and I'm so happy to have you here. I want to thank our co-sponsors, the Black Student Assembly, Brothers Breaking Bread, the Center for Black Cultural and Student Affairs, and the Student Assembly for Gender Empowerment. I am grateful for your support and partnership. And now, it is my complete honor and privilege to present to you Professor Ange Marie Hancock Alfaro and the legendary educator and activist, and one of my idols, Dr. Angela Davis. Thank you so much, Daria, and thank you for reaching out. Um, the instant I got your email, <laughs> the answer was yes, um, because what can we truly say about Professor Dr. Angela Davis that we have not already said? Um, her accomplishments are legendary, um, and I'm looking forward to this conversation. Um, and so I just wanted to let you all know that I'll go ahead and ask a couple of questions, um, but we will also intersperse uh, questions from students. Um, and so I just wanted to kind of advise that I'll ask one or two questions now. Um, and the first one, um, Dr. Davis, quite frankly, um, the autobiography of Angela Davis changed my life as a college sophomore. Um, I read it cover to cover in a single trip on a Greyhound bus back to Ohio to visit. Um, and it became a touchstone for me in many ways over the years. Um, and of course, by now there are so many more. Um, Daria listed just some of them. Um, I wanna ask a question about the relationship between your activism and your writing. How does the activism inform the writing? And how does continuing to write, not becoming a full-time activist, like finding that time to write, um, also sustain you? Well, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me to participate in, in this event for incoming students at USC. Um, and um, uh, Aunt Marie, it's wonderful to see you again after um, a few years. And thank you so much for uh, telling me about your experience with my autobiography. Uh, 
uh, you'll be surprised perhaps to learn that I'm in the process of reading it as well right now. <laughs> and I do not really like to read my own work, but a new edition is, uh, is coming out soon. Uh, Haymarket is publishing a new edition and they've asked me to write an extended introduction. Uh, so I have to remember what I wrote when I was 28 years old. <laughs> um, but to answer your question, to begin to answer your question, I think I would probably say that uh, I don't easily live inside of all of these categories that are uh, considered to, to reflect distinct activities. I don't, you know, there's the category of the writer, the activist, the academic, the teacher, the public intellectual, the organizer. Uh, um, although I do try to do all of this, <laughs> uh, but not necessarily by considering myself uh, to be an activist uh, who writes or a writer who is an activist. So, um, I guess I would say that virtually all of my life, I've been interested in how we can affect the future, how we can forge uh, new futures. Um, not so much as an individual goal, but as a collective undertaking. So I try to do this in many ways. This is how I came to academia, how I came to organizing, how I came to activism. Um, and I should tell you that I never really imagined myself as a person uh, whom other people want to hear from. Um, this became a possibility after I was, I suppose I would say inadvertently thrust into the limelight uh, as a consequence in the first place of being fired from my first job at UCLA. And in the second place as having been um, charged with a number of very serious uh, offenses because of my activism in the case around the Soledad brothers. Uh, so I see myself as uh, using the platform that has been given to me to try to push movements forward. Uh, uh, and if that requires um, teaching, that is what I do. If that requires writing, that is what I do. Uh, speaking, so forth and so on. But I don't make these hard and fast distinctions uh, between each activity. Uh, so, um, you know, I, 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 I'm in the process of writing right now, um, but I consider that as a part of my activism, if you understand what I'm saying. Uh, uh, and the very, the first published piece I wrote, um, I was in jail. And I wrote it uh, because it seemed to me that uh, in the movement at that time, uh, this was of course the uh, early 1970s, uh, we needed to uh, acquire a sense of history. So I wrote a piece called, um, if I can remember the title, The Role of um, the Black Woman in the Community of Slaves. Uh, and that had to do with the fact that um, um, influences that were rooted in slavery, I think, uh, were affecting our movements at that time. Uh, uh, so, yeah, uh, I, I could go on and on, but I think I'll, I think you get what I'm trying to say. I, I do, and uh, and I remember that article. Um, read it, I think, the very next year in college, <laughs> um, and came back to it in my own work. Um, so it, it is really transformative and it leads to sort of my next question. Um, so I'm glad you're writing this extended introduction. I'll give you another piece of your autobiography that, uh, um, that I wanted to ask about and link it to this, um, this connection to slavery. Um, because in your autobiography, you do talk about the impact of violence that your community experienced. Um, you talk about the bombing in Birmingham, for example, and you know, and that um, killed four little girls your own age, um, and its influence on the work that you do as an adult. Um, and so, I wanted to ask a question about the violence our children today are now seeing through viral videos. 
Um, you know, George Floyd is just one of the latest, um, and there are some that have happened after him. Um, I wanted to think about this idea that you were talking about in terms of the collective and the collective experience, right, of that violence um, and connect it to larger movements um, like Black Lives Matter, the prison abolition movement that you are accredited with so much of the foundation for, I think rightly so, um, or even movements against gun violence. Um, and I'm just really wanting to think about this connection between violence, the violence of slavery, the violence of capitalism, the violence, you know, of terrorist threats that happen on our soil. Um, and how do we think about that in connection with the movements today? Well, this is um, an enormous issue and uh, perhaps far more complicated uh, than uh, we were able to um, perceive early on. Uh, and when I was growing up in Birmingham, Alabama, which uh, was the most segregated uh, city in, in, in the South, and uh, a city in which the Black community was accustomed to waves of violence occasioned by uh, the Ku Klux Klan and other white supremacist uh, groups. Um, there was also, I guess I would say, there was also internecine violence, but, but largely in the fight form of fights and, and, and gun violence was not unknown at that time, but the magnitude didn't even begin to approach what we are now experiencing uh, uh, when uh, um, you, you know, talk about all the various manifestations uh, of, of, of violence. So, of course, at that time, there was also violence in, uh, in the, the prevailing visual culture, but nothing akin to what exists today um, on social media, games, and films, uh, uh, et cetera. You know, I'm thinking about, I'm thinking about um, 50 years ago uh, and how formations like games uh, in our communities began to transform as a consequence of the emergence of the Black Panther Party. Uh, and the, 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 the way in which uh, arguments were made that uh, it was, um, it was you know, necessary to uh, challenge that internecine violence uh, uh, by coming together in a campaign to rid our uh, communities of police occupation. Uh, now, of course, uh, our sense of, of what constitutes uh, the threat of violence is so much vaster than it was that I'm, I'm thinking now about the um, ways in which uh, feminist scholars and activists have urged us to think about connections between um, uh, state violence and intimate violence uh, uh, and are pointing out uh, that uh, that that we cannot um, um, think about imprisonment and uh, uh, carcer other carceral uh, strategies as a response to gender violence uh, uh, because of the way in which gender violence is linked to state violence uh, uh, so I suppose, you know, what I would say is that uh, we should really take seriously the analyses and uh, the forms of practice that have been developed by anti-racist, anti-capitalist, uh, uh, feminist uh, organizations and, 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 and approaches uh, uh, because, you know, otherwise, uh, uh, with blinders on, we assume that we might be able to use one form of violence in order to combat another. And this is uh, precisely uh, the problem uh, with respect to those uh, uh, feminists uh, who still argue that um, um, 
that we need to continue the criminalization of, of gender violence um, without necessarily being attentive to the ways in which uh, these forms of state violence uh, 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 carry out uh, of racist mandates and are responsible, you know, for example, for mass incarceration. Uh, uh, so I guess I'll conclude by saying it's very complicated, and this is precisely why uh, the feminist contributions to an understanding of the interrelationality of different forms of violence are so important at this point. Yes, I absolutely want to come back to that question of why analyzing from the framework of gender is equally important, um, and your work has been critical in that area. Um, I want to turn it over now by welcoming Aisha Cisse. Uh, she is a first year student in health and human sciences. Go ahead and ask your question. Hello. Um, my question is, in your opinion, why have we not achieved the changes we've been struggling for? Um, well, first of all, thank you so much uh, for that question. And, and I would uh, propose begin to propose an answer by saying that actually we have achieved a great deal. Um, even though we aren't where we ought to be and where we want to be. But if one compares uh, where we are today to 50 years ago, uh, uh, there are many ways in which we have um, moved forward and achieved you know, progress. I often say that, um, we didn't win the revolution we thought we were fighting for. Uh, but we won many victories uh, and we did help to change the world. And I, I think that we're in a better position today than ever before to uh, move along a trajectory that will bring us uh, uh, more victories and more progress. I'm not going to say that we will ever really achieve what it is we want, because I think we will always want more, and we should always want more. And in the process of fighting for what we thought we wanted, we realized that we also needed more than what we were asking for. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I often point out that in the very beginning, when, when we had no consciousness of gender, uh, even though many of us recognized that women were doing all of the work uh, and were, were also giving leadership to our struggles, the, the movement was framed as liberation for the Black man. And it was only in the process of engaging in those struggles that we became aware that we had to broaden our vision, that we, we had to think about Black women. Uh, and then, of course, uh, we realized that we, we had to think about queer Black women, trans Black women. Uh, and then we realized we had to broaden our categories of gender uh, uh, so that we had to move beyond a, a binary conception of gender. Uh, so you see, if we had... Uh, not been attempting to achieve uh, a goal that was uh, not really inclusive at the time, we would not have become aware of how much more we needed to do. And I think that that is the dynamic that we can still witness. Uh, you know, how do we make our movements uh, relevant to, for example, disabled people? Uh, and how can we learn from the experience of uh, of, 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 of the organizing experience of disabled people, uh, for example, especially in relationship to incarceration and other carceral issues. Uh, you know, how can we incorporate uh, concern for the planet into our struggles? Uh, so I, you know, as someone who's been around for a long time, I've seen an enormous number of changes, uh, but also I imagine uh, that in the future, uh, there will be new um, issues emerging that I cannot even begin to conceptualize now. That is the nature of, uh, of, of, of radical mass movements. 
Yes, I think, you know, um, I wanted to kind of speak directly to what you were talking about um, through the lens of your prison abolition work. Um, you know, I remember you mentioning prisons all the way back in the 1990s, you know, um, and the ideas you discussed in that first 1999 book, The Prison Industrial Complex, um, are now much more firmly in the mainstream. So actually, I guess I want to ask a question that dovetails nicely with Aisha's, you know, um, how have your own views evolved over the course of the several books, um, including abolition democracy, among others? Um, are we genuinely closer to abolition in the United States through perhaps some of the tragedies that we've experienced over the past five to 10 years than we could have been? Um, well, uh, yeah, um, I've been talking about prison issues forever, it seems. I, I, you know, sometimes I sound like a broken record to myself. But, but at the same time, I realize that if there weren't those of us who continue uh, to insist on these issues, we might not be where we are uh, today. So yes, uh, in 1997, I was um, actually uh, in the process of organizing, helping to organize a, 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 a massive conference um, that took place in September of 1998 called um, Critical Resistance Beyond the Prison Industrial Complex. So, um, but I should tell you that the, my first encounter with the possibility of proposing abolitionist strategies uh, in relation to the prison system was in um, 1971, I believe, uh, when the Attica Prison Rebellion took place in September of 1971. And, and the brothers there who were in the leadership of that uh, uprising uh, talked about uh, uh, the talked about the possibility of getting rid of prisons entirely and, 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 and imagining new ways of addressing the issues that prison uh, proposed uh, to, to deal with. So, so yeah, it's been over 50 years. Uh, um, or I would say in September of this year, it will be 50 years. Exactly, but then there's a much longer genealogy. I could you know, talk about uh, the fact that um, there have been critiques of the use of, of carceral methods uh, since the actual invention of the prison as uh, uh, the dominant mode of, uh, 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 of punishment in, in this country. Uh, so, uh, I, 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 to tell the truth, and I've said this many times over the last period, uh, I'm, I, I am totally um, amazed by this moment uh, because I never imagined, literally never imagined that I would be alive when abolitionist discourses would enter into the mainstream, um, when people would begin to seriously engage with these questions. Um, I think I considered the work that we were doing in much the same way as uh, people who were uh, calling for the abolition of slavery, um, knowing that there was no real possibility at the moment, uh, that, that because everyone, slavery was such a naturalized institution that most people in this country, including probably uh, many people who were enslaved, that they could not imagine um, life without that institution. Uh, uh, yet, they fought against the institution and made it possible for abolition uh, uh, to occur for at least uh, the, the institution itself to be dismantled. I'm not going to suggest that slavery was fully um, abolished. Uh, this is one of the reasons we decided to, to uh, take up uh, the, the, the idea that uh, while there were 19th century abolitionists fighting against slavery, 
20th century abolition is fighting against uh, uh, the residues uh, 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 of, of slavery against, quote, second class citizenship, the, what we call the civil rights movement, Howard Zinn's book, uh, 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 on SNCC, for example, is entitled The New Abolitionists. Uh, and so we imagine a 21st century abolition, abolitionism uh, that uh, would target uh, state violence in the form of the uh, uh, prison and in the form of the police. Uh, and so I'm just, I, 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 I wake up some mornings and, and uh, am and genuinely amazed uh, that so many people now are thinking seriously about this issue. Yes, and I think that one of the markers also, unfortunately, of success is how much the pushback that comes as well. Um, and I think that's the other piece of what we're dealing with right now. Um, and I was just looking up because I, I had to when you reminded me of 1971. I like in my diary, I remember writing just her the way she talks about her relationship with George Jackson and the Soledad brothers. And, and so I, you're absolutely, I, obviously it's your life. I know you're right about it in terms of 1971, but just that idea um, that uh, Michel Foucault's Discipline and Punish was published four years later. So for all of you intellectual historians out there, there were people talking about this, um, you know, with respect to Michel Foucault, um, before Michel Foucault was writing and talking about this as well. Um, so next I want to introduce one of our political science majors, um, Molly Holzinger, um, and she's going to ask her question. Go ahead, Molly. Um, hi, Dr. Davis. I am so grateful to be here. Um, my question is, in your work, Women, Race, and Class, you discuss the lack of intersection in the women's rights movement and abolitionism. What do you believe is the most pressing lack of intersection in current activist movements? Well, thank you so much for that question. Uh, and, um, and I'm not sure whether I can <clears throat> give you a real answer without uh, reflecting very specifically on uh, you know, which uh, movements and organizations have embraced um, um, the notion of intersectionality. Um, but uh, let, me, um, let me say, I was referring before to the movements against gender violence uh, and the assumption uh, that gender violence is to be treated as any other crime and therefore subject uh, to the same kinds of uh, institutional uh, 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 um, forms of addressing it. Um, and of course we have a term now, which is carceral feminism. Uh, which is a critique of those feminists who argue that gender violence uh, can be addressed simply by putting the individual perpetrators behind bars. Uh, and um, of course, I can remember uh, when, when, when we were beginning to talk about abolition and um, feminism, um, there, there, there were many people who considered themselves feminists who said, well, no, why at the precise moment when we have managed to criminalize um, sexual assault and other forms of gender violence after you know, decades and centuries of these forms of violence not even counting as crimes, now, why do you then call for abolition precisely at this uh, moment? Uh, and so, you know, as a consequence, uh, 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 there, there, there have been some movement leaders, um, uh, scholars, scholar activists, Beth Ritchie, for example, who was a part of the, uh, that movement against gender violence, who, who've been giving serious thought to how one can bring these issues together and how one can um, um, discover 
ways of minimizing and hopefully eventually uh, eliminating agenda violence that don't result in the um, um, in mass incarceration and don't result in 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 in, in the um, forms of state violence uh, that are so associated with racism. Um, so I, you know, I, I should tell you that um, I'm actually working on a book uh, right now as we speak uh, with uh, Beth Ritchie and Erica Miners, who is a, a, a wonderful scholar activist. Her background is in education and, and Gina Dent, uh, who uh, focuses on uh, visual culture. And we're trying to write a book about precisely the issue you raised. And the, 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 the title is Abolition Feminism Now. But thank you so much for, for, for that question. I would I like to be more specific, uh, but uh, unfortunately we don't have uh, the time to I do justice uh, to the issue that you raise, but thank you so much for raising it. So, and I was going to bring up that book, so I'm glad that you did. Um, and uh, while you're waiting for that book to come out, Beth Ritchie also has an incredible book, Arrested Justice, um, where she really connects those dots in very important ways that I assign to virtually every student who asks me that question, in addition to the books that you've written. Um, I wanted to ask a question um, that's related to Molly's, but perhaps a little bit different. Um, I wanted to ask um, you to turn our attention towards what we are refusing to look at. So just as in 50 years ago, you were turning us in a place that we had refused to look at in terms of mass incarceration in the prison system, I'm wondering if there are places that we refuse to look at right now that we should be looking at. Um, so it's not, it's not quite Molly's question, but it's really, you know, again, thinking through where our children might be 50 years from now. Um, you know, what kinds of things, and I know you don't have a crystal ball, but I, I couldn't resist the opportunity for asking you. Well, <clears throat> that's actually not a very difficult question for me to answer uh, uh, because, uh, uh, for such a long time, I have uh, believed that um, that we're refusing to see the elephant in the room. Um, and for me, that's capitalism. Um, you know, which is why uh, the abolitionist movement has the potential to become a revolutionary movement. Uh, uh, that is to say, a movement that not only calls for radical changes to the criminal legal system, but calls for radical changes to the entire society. Uh, and so we often make the point that uh, we're not trying to fix single institutions. Uh, this is why we don't consider ourselves reformists. We're not trying to fix the prison system or fix the police. What we're trying to do is urge a radical transformation of, of, of our society, of the social, economic, and political circumstances that render these institutions so necessary. So the question really is, uh, rather than, you know, what can we do to make these institutions more humane? Uh, the question is, how can we change the society um, uh, so that uh, it no longer needs to rely on such repressive um, institutions in order to guarantee um, safety, health, and security in our communities. Uh, and uh, the system of capitalism is uh, the backdrop for all of this. Uh, uh, the what we call mass incarceration. Uh, uh, emerge precisely as a consequence of the this most recent phase of global capitalism uh, and uh, the um, effort to uh, break down all of the 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 um, 
institutions that provided you know, some kind of collective uh, uh, safety net for people uh, uh, and to re replace these institutions with a um, with the notion that the individual is responsible for everything. The individual is the primary unit of, of society. And if there are problems, those problems can always be traced uh, back to um, individual, individual failures uh, to um, do this or that. Uh, so that neoliberal uh, discourse associated with uh, the structural changes that have happened uh, as a consequence of global capitalism, uh, these issues have to be addressed if we are interested in uh, moving towards substantive change. Uh, and I can say that uh, thanks to the Occupy movement of um, the 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 first decade of the 21st century, uh, 2011, as a matter of fact, I think uh, uh, um, we're talking about the emergence of, of, of this movement that gave us the vocabulary to criticize capitalism. Uh, and now, of course, we have a number of people um, in uh, Congress who identify as socialists, uh, um, but I think we have a long way to go. Uh, and and um, it's very important now to encourage people to think really deeply about the way this uh, system uh, has both provided us uh, with uh, uh, the kinds of, uh, of, of, of possibilities that we could have never imagined. I mean, for example, Zoom, uh, you know, so that we're able to have of this webinar, uh, but at the same time, it has damaged uh, the so many people and destroyed lives and allowed for the wealth of the planet to be accumulated in, in by uh, a relatively few number of, of men. Uh, uh, so I think I'm always looking toward the future. And, uh, and the future I see uh, as a future of justice, equality, and freedom uh, will have to be a future in which capitalism uh, no longer uh, uh, drives uh, uh, the planet in the way that it does today. Yes, I, I think that elephant in the room, what we're refusing to look at. Um, and I think there are very good reasons for that. Um, as you've articulated. I'd like to turn now to Penda Ba, um, who is a first year student in global health. Um, Penda, would you like to ask your question? Ms. Davis, um, so my question to you is, what are your thoughts on the rise of acknowledgement of intersectional identities and multifaceted liberation? And what do you think it means for the different emancipatory struggles that have been ongoing? So do you think it makes it easier or harder to achieve liberation? Hmm. That's a really interesting question. Um, uh, and I think I would say, um, it makes us. It makes it easier to uh, imagine liberation and to move in that direction. And at the same time, the analyses and the the forms of practice that we need are much harder uh, because we're not allowed uh, to be myopic in our vision. We're not allowed to um, only focus on one issue. Uh, we, we have to take into consideration how that uh, those, these issues are deeply contextualized. Uh, and it's not just issues around race and gender and sexuality and, and, and uh, ability and so forth. Uh, uh, we're talking about, um, I guess you would say, I, uh, I don't know, off the top of my head, I'm just, I'm, I'm talking about the messiness of social reality. Reality uh, rarely conforms to our concepts and categories. And at the same time, we need those kind of concepts and categories in order to try to make sense of the world. 
But social reality always exceeds our capacity to make sense of it. Uh, and, 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 and therefore, I believe the more we move in the direction of attempting to apprehend um, the uh, profound complexity of our realities, and intersectionality is just you know, one term that has been, and, and one strategy, intellectual strategy, and you know, one um, organizing strategy that has been offered to us. Uh, you know, let's not forget that, that intersectionality, although it's a term we you know, very easily use today, and it's generally attributed to um, Kimberly Crenshaw, who uh, uh, introduced the term itself in her legal writing. Uh, that there have been efforts going all the way back to the 19th century, uh, at, 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 especially uh, by um, the forerunners of Black feminism who have insisted on thinking issues together. Uh, uh, you know, let's not forget that Anna Julia Cooper at the end of the 19th century called for this. Uh, Le Lelio Gonzalez in, in, in Brazil called upon us to think issues of Black liberation and Indigenous liberation together. Uh, uh, then we can think about Lorraine Hansberry and, 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 and the, the Black communist uh, feminist or proto-feminist, however you want to uh, call them, of, of the McCarthy era who were talking about super exploitation and who were talking about triple exploitation. Uh, and Fran Beale, when she wrote her book, wrote her pamphlet, Double Jeopardy. Uh, so there's a, there, and, and, and I know that, uh, um, uh, Andrew Marie, that you, you know this very well because this is what you study. <laughs> uh, but I, I, I think that um, we will move further and, and, and come up with even um, more interesting strategies uh, to help us uh, both recognize uh, that there is a, a world out there that needs to be understood, and at the same time to recognize that our conceptual apparatus is, is, is rarely able to um, uh, completely apprehend uh, the tumultuousness uh, of our social worlds. Thank you. So I actually want to come back to that because I think one of the things I struggle with as someone who does study intersectionality, um, who knows we need to go back to the 19th century, for example. Um, I want to come back to something you were talking about a little bit earlier with regard to the folks who identify as socialists in Congress. Um, and something I asked you about a little bit earlier with regard to pushback. Um, and so certainly what's happened with intersectionality is that there is what intersectionality is, um, and then there is the well-intended misappropriation and misunderstanding, and then there is, of course, the nefarious distortion. And so I wanted to ask you about that with regard to Marxism and socialism and the ways in which Occupy has opened a conversation AOC, Bernie Sanders, we could come up with any you know, number of folks um, who maybe have opened a space, but that there has been this distortion that's entered in. And I wanted to ask about how we grapple with the idea that as we expand access and familiarity, we also have to grapple with this intentional distortion. Um, yeah, that is true. Uh, and, 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 and thank you for phrasing it uh, in, in, in that way, um, uh, uh, precisely because uh, there are, are efforts to blunt the uh, possible impact of, of these new intellectual strategies, uh, uh, you know, just as uh, we often insist on distinguishing between reform and abolition. And at the same time, uh, there are those who continue to insist that, um, that the work we do is reformist. <laughs> I don't know how many times I've been characterized as a reformist, and I have to say that that is precisely uh, how I do not identify. Uh, 
Um, but um, uh, yeah, um, it is. Um, I guess. I guess the the way you phrase the question makes me uh, recognize how important ideological struggle is, and how uh, even as we call for very specific structural changes, we also have to um, insist on ideological struggle. Uh, it's, um, it's wonderful that we have people in Congress now who identify as, as socialists. Uh, um, uh, but, um, but at the same time, uh, I would argue that there, there are many different forms of socialism. Uh, so, so, you know, there's the, the Scandinavian model of socialism, you know, which is of course much better than what we have here. Um, but, but, but I would like to see uh, the complete dismantling of capitalist structures. Uh, and um, I, I would like to see the kind of uh, revolutionary socialism that uh, uh, not only transforms the conditions of, of, of production, uh, but, but also is attentive to you know, all of the issues that are often um, underestimated as being identitarian in, in character. Uh, because these issues, it seems to me, and I'm, of course I'm talking about uh, struggles against racism um, uh, that are undertaken by various uh, uh, communities that have been subject to uh, different uh, uh, histories of race, racist attacks from you know, indigenous people uh, to Asian Americans uh, uh, who are uh, uh, you know, suffering uh, as a consequence of the way in which the former president uh, began to characterize this health crisis and this terrible violence, uh, virus that we're uh, still experiencing. Um, so I would, um, you know, I, 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 I would um, argue that, um, that perhaps we need all of that. We need the, we, we need the, the, the socialists who are in Congress because it subverts uh, 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 you know, what we have uh, 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 witnessed as the, the ways in which Congress uh, 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 operates. I, I, you know, I love the fact that we have Cori Bush, uh, uh, who, whose activism uh, you know, during uh, the Ferguson uh, uprisings uh, was, is legendary. Um, and of course, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and, 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 you know, all of the, 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 the wonderful women. I mean, that's amazing to have that squad in, in, in Congress that listens to uh, the struggles of, of people in the streets. So, uh, but at the same time, I think uh, uh, we need to insist on radical versions of socialism. Uh, you know, some of us need to be out here saying that uh, we cannot be satisfied with what has been offered to us. Uh, uh, we need to continue the struggle and, you know, hopefully, hopefully it will move it will allow us to move along a trajectory uh, where uh, we win more victories. Yes, ask for more, as you had talked about it a little bit earlier. Um, so we're going to turn it over to another student who's going to ask a question. And then after that, I'm going to skip my last question because we've gotten some really good questions from students who are attending at the webinar. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Jacob Sachs, uh, who's a new sophomore in economics. Go ahead, Jacob. Hi, Dr. Davis. I first want to thank you for being here and providing an opportunity to engage in discussion with you. Uh, to preface my question, you found success in your pursuit of change making and your writing and activism are very clearly full of passion. So my question for you, Dr. Davis, is what advice would you give to students looking to lead a fulfilling life that is driven by their passions? Mm. Oh, what a great question. Uh, thank you. Um, um, what advice would I give uh, to uh, students who are looking forward to leading a, a life that is driven by their passions? Uh, um, you know, I don't know whether I have any advice, uh, 
but the way you describe it, uh, I, I, I think, is um, a framework that can help students and other young people recognize how important it is to love what one does uh, and, 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 and to make decisions regarding uh, one's future, not on the basis of how much uh, money I will earn or what my parents want me to do. Uh, my parents wanted me to be a doctor. <laughs> And, uh, and I thought that's what I wanted to be for a long time until I became involved in, um, I started studying French and, and realized uh, how much I love literature and philosophy and the humanities. Uh, and that became my passion. Uh, and I've been fortunate to be able to do this virtually all my life. Uh, but had I listened uh, to... Um, my parents, and of course I did listen to them in, in, in many ways. My mother was a great activist, uh, uh, by the way. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, had I done what I thought I was supposed to do, uh, uh, I might be living a fulfilling life you know, as a physician. Uh, but uh, at one point a light bulb went off and, and I realized that I like the humanities a lot more than I like the sciences. Uh, and of course there are people who well, like the sciences a lot more than uh, than, than than the humanities, uh, but I do think that it's it's important to um, for each individual to discover, uh, you know, what uh, what brings uh, them uh, pleasure, uh, and to try to find ways to um, move uh, into their studies as well as to move into activism uh, uh, that will reflect what brings them pleasure. Uh, because, uh, um, you know, this is not uh, something that you commit to for a, a few weeks or a few months or a few years. Uh, if it is to be a lifetime commitment, uh, then um, it can only be sustained. Uh, uh, by a sense of uh, fulfillment. But let me just say one thing. I never actually um, thought about success in the way we frame it today. Um, I never thought about individual success in the way we frame it. Uh, uh, I'm, I, I think I'm very fortunate to have grown up under those terrible conditions of, of, of white supremacy and uh, apartheid, absolute racial segregation in, in, in the South, because it made me understand how important community is. Uh, uh, and that uh, the, the, the work that we do is not so much about individual success uh, as it is about changing the world. Uh, and one can uh, experience pleasure and passion and joy uh, in that process. Absolutely. Um, thank you very much, Jacob. Uh, so I wanted to turn to a question that we've gotten um, from the audience. Um, and so I'm gonna ask a question from Martina, uh, who is tuning in all the way from Brazil. Um, and she has a question and I'm gonna add a little bit of a twist um, to the end of the question that a colleague of mine sent um, when he learned of this. Um, Martina asks, if you can talk about the importance of international solidarity towards oppressed groups all over the world. Um, and the, the only twist I wanna put on that is with the benefit of hindsight, I, I'm wondering if there have ever been um, places in your life where you've expressed international solidarity or even domestic solidarity and then live to regret it or to or to realize that you needed to somehow pull back. Because I think that's another important part of organizing is learning from where coalition works or where solidarity works, but also learning where it doesn't or where it should not work. So I wanted to ask that little twist. Hold on one second. Um, I had to switch to a laptop from my desk Top and I just realized that it is not uh, plugged in. 
So I don't want to lose power. I'm going to just plug it in for a second and then come right back, okay? <laughs> too many chords here okay <laughs> uh great now it's charging good um well well you know first of all let me um uh thank uh the the student uh, for the question about international solidarity uh and um uh and let, let me say that um that that I've been active over the last uh, period uh, in Brazil and in and, 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 um, both intellectual and movement projects that uh, you know call for solidarity, especially among uh, uh, black women and other women of color in Brazil and in, in, in the US. Uh, uh, so thank you for that question uh, because I, I absolutely believe that um, uh, we harm ourselves uh, uh, with uh, myopic and uh, provincialized thinking when we assume uh, that because we live in a country like the US, uh, uh, we are the center of the world. Uh, um, and that we cannot learn from struggles in in, in, in Brazil, uh, you know, for example, or, or in, in, in South Africa, or uh, uh, in India, uh, the Dalit uh, uh, struggle against the caste system, and particularly feminists out there. Um, so thank you so much uh, for uh, raising that question, because uh, had we completed uh, this session and not talked about the international uh, framework, uh, I would have been very upset. Uh, um, and I guess I, I, I'm, uh, there's so many ways in which I could answer this question, but I will uh, begin by saying that, um, that I have always uh, tried to ground uh, my thinking and my, uh, involvement in movements uh, uh, in an internationalist uh, uh, perspective. Uh, you know, I often tell tell the story of uh, of moving from the South uh, to the Northeast to New York uh, because I I thought that I would uh, find more freedom uh, there. I thought I would uh, that there would be less um, racism, uh, so to speak. Uh, uh, and and in in New York. Although it was an amazing experience, and I'm so glad I had the opportunity to attend high school in New York and uh, uh, and and college in the Boston area, I, I realized that uh, racism expressed itself in different ways. Uh, um, uh, but I, I was I was also laboring under the illusion that a place like France uh, was uh, uh, with its um, emphasis on, on, on freedom and fraternity and equality would be the, the place where I would be most likely to um, uh, feel as if I had escaped racism. And I discovered that that was not true at all. Uh, uh, but as a young person, uh, during my first trip to France, uh, in the middle of the uh, Algerian Revolution, I, I, I discovered the importance of international solidarity and became involved in the campaign um, to uh, um, challenge the French government uh, uh, for their effort to uh, put down the Algerian Revolution. And so I think today, um, we have the capacity to communicate across national borders. Uh, and we don't use that as much as we should. Uh, of course, uh, the capitalists uh, have completely exploited this uh, new um, possibility. As a matter of fact, it emerges precisely as a, as a, as a capitalist uh, effort 
to globalize uh, capitalist production, but also to allow um, you know, everything to move across borders. Um, excuse me. <coughs> Products, uh, production strategies, uh, um, money, et cetera. The only thing that capitalism does not like to cross borders is people. So everything else is in this constant flow. Uh, but we still assume that the nation state is the permanent form of human community. And I think that as we try to imagine a world without prisons, as we try to imagine a world uh, where police, armed police are not the guarantors of, of, of safety and security, it might be helpful to try to imagine a world in which the nation state um, is not the central um, mode of human community. Uh, and I think that there will come a time in the future where uh, we will not have these borders in the same way, where people um, will uh, not be treated so repressively simply because they're looking for a better life. Uh, uh, and where borders and walls, apartheid walls in, in, in Israel-Palestine, for example, uh, uh, are, are, are not the ways in which uh, we ad address uh, these um, tendencies. So, you know, I think, yes, international solidarity now, and in the future, let us try to imagine um, a world in which we all consider ourselves global citizens. Excellent. Um, I, I want to ask, uh, as we think about this idea of organizing, um, we have another question from Camila um, that is, is very brass tacks. Um, Camila asks, how do you overcome the emotional burnout in this fight for social change? And, and we got another question that was anonymous that talked about something similar all of the violence in terms of violent backlash that happens. We ask peacefully, we get violence as a result. We ask strongly, we ask weakly, we always get the violence as a result. Um, and so Camila's question is, how do you maintain the motivation to continue to fight for a better future? And the anonymous question um, was asked really about what you were just talking about, which is in the face of so much violence, how do you not resort to violence as the solution or, or should we resort to violence as the solution? I'm gonna try and ask two questions there since we're time sensitive here. <laughs> well, okay. Um, well, first of all, the, uh, the question of uh, burnout. Um, and, you know, of course, um, of course, all of us who are doing this work get tired, and, and that's a human response. Uh, uh, and and I don't um, I don't want you to assume that it requires this uh, heroism and courage and you know all of these uh, capacities uh, uh, that we often project onto individuals. Uh, 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 what it requires is a commitment to a collective struggle. And people can participate in that struggle in the way that most befits them at particular moments. And when they're tired, um, they should rest. I mean, it's simple. But because we are so influenced by uh, neoliberal ideologies of uh, individualism, uh, you know, heroic individualism, uh, uh, you know, which is also a masculine, masculinist construct. Uh, we, we forget that it's communities, it's um, masses of people, it's collective groups uh, that are tasked with moving forward. Uh, and as individuals, we play an important role, but if we are aware of the collective nature of our 
pursuits, then we recognize that it's okay for one individual to step back for a while because the community, the collective will, will move forward. Uh, we don't have to feel obligated uh, to be present uh, all the time. Uh, uh, and that, I think, is a consequence of the way in which we um, imagine ourselves uh, as individuals, uh, uh, as uh, individuals um, who need to be, um, you know, who knows what, uh, charismatic and, 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 and people who are capable of these, these, these amazing uh, uh, feats, uh, uh, people who don't have to rest, people who don't get emotionally uh, 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 in, entangled with the work that they're doing. No. And that's just not true. Um, I love Audre Lorde and, 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 and the way in which she acknowledges uh, you know, all of the, um, you know, all of the factors that might prevent us from making the contributions we want to make, fear, for example. And of course, we're afraid. Uh, everyone should be afraid of some things. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we still can't do the work. That doesn't mean that we don't uh, acquire courage by coming together. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, courage is always collective courage. Uh, it's not individual courage. Um, and, and when we think collectively, it means that we recognize that we need to take care of ourselves, uh, uh, that we need to do the things that will allow us to con continue to contribute to that uh, uh, collective uh, uh, and that collective uh, trajectory. Uh, uh, so yeah, that is for, what, what was the second question? I got so caught up in the first question that, uh, uh, you no, I think you answered both of them. Don't worry. Um, I think the other one was uh, it, it dovetails with the last two questions that I'm going to ask you. So I'll just go ahead and ask those two. Um, the first is from Jenna Mosley, who says that her great uncle David Mosley um, was an artist for the Black Panther Party um, and wants to know what role do you believe art still plays in social justice? And then the last thing, just on your point just now about doing the things that sustain yourselves, um, I wanted to ask an anonymous question um, was about what brings you joy? Um, mm -hmm. What, you know, how do you do things that sustain you? Okay. Well, actually, I think I can answer those two questions together uh, uh, because uh, art brings me joy. <laughs> um, you know, music brings me joy. Uh, and of course, I remember David Mosley, uh, uh, and I am so happy to hear from uh, his granddaughter. Right? Uh, um, I um, I think that artists, uh, and I'm thinking about artists in the broadest possible uh, 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 framework, broadest possible construction, have an extremely important role to play in giving leadership to our struggles. Uh, uh, because um, art can move us in ways uh, that uh, we don't necessarily get moved from listening to uh, a speech at a rally or reading an analysis. Uh, so, uh, you know, art, um, art can help us uh, um, maneuver our uh, way toward the future by uh, giving us the opportunity to feel what we don't yet know how to articulate in words. Uh, and that sense of, uh, of, 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 of community that I was talking about is, I think, present in the way in which we um, uh, um, appreciate art and, and, and music, how we listen, uh, you know, how we watch films. We're, it's, 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 
even though we may be involved as individuals, we're always uh, uh, situated within a kind of imagined community uh, of, of, of people who you know, also love to listen uh, to this uh, music. Uh, uh, you know, I was listening to Christian Scott, the jazz uh, a tr a trumpet player a little while ago and thinking, oh my God, what, what powerful, what beautiful music that, that makes us want to um, create a world that is powerful and beautiful. Uh, uh, I think that unfortunately we have tended to assume that art, uh, visual art is there to illustrate you know, what uh, uh, scholars and thinkers are able to uh, uh, come up with. Uh, but I think that is completely um, uh, underestimating the part that art plays in uh, moving us in the direction of uh, revolutionary struggle. Um, uh, and and one can, if, if one looks at the ways in which so many musicians uh, um, in so many different genres, uh, you know, from hip hop to jazz, have, have used this historical moment to uh, produce um, music, that is directly relevant to our effort to uh, uh, challenge the structural racism of policing uh, uh, and uh, the um, yeah the, the 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 ways in which popular artists and um, jazz artists and also you know people who work in the genre of classical European music. Uh, uh, this is a moment uh, when uh, so many people have uh, made it very clear that they want to use their talents to contribute to the effort to uh, move our, our country forward, our country and the planet forward. Absolutely. Um, I was, I could name a host of different artists um, who, again, and I think all of us could, right? That's the wonderful thing about art and music is that it really can sustain you, um, but also push you in directions you never dreamed you would be pushed. Um, and so I, I, unfortunately, we got so many more questions than we had time to answer, as is always the case. We could have been here for another hour and another hour after that, or at least I certainly could have, and I suspect many of you could as well. So on behalf of USC and Visions and Voices, we want to thank the illustrious luminous um, Dr. Angela Davis for joining us today. Um, and we also want to thank all of you uh, for tuning in. Um, this has been um, a tremendous conversation um, and we look forward to seeing you back on campus if you're a student um, in the months to come. Um, and again, we wish you good health and a better world. Thank you. Thank you.